what's in a name? This congregation goes by the name Waterville UCC, or Waterville United Church of Christ. But technically, we're First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ. Because traditionally, long ago, we were part of the Congregational Denomination, which became part of the Congregational and Christian Churches, which then became a part of the United Church of Christ. It's a lofty name. It's something to live up to. Try as we might, the United Church of Christ sometimes comes off more as the untied Church of Christ. But we do try. Our motto is united and uniting. It's good to have something in our name that calls us, that helps us be more than what we currently are, that we live up to. What name were you given at birth? Does it fit? Or do you need a new name like this? There are folks who were born with one gender assigned at birth and given a name that matches that, that no longer matches their reality and have to transition and get people to accept a new name. That's not that easy, is it? But it can change. We certainly are accustomed to people changing their names when they get married and we learn and adjust. Because we understand that people live into what they are called to be. Well, today on Marginal Way, that's exactly what we're going to look at. What's your calling? What's your vocation? What name are you called by? There's one name that we should all be named by. And we're going to look at that today. So come with us on this journey. Welcome to today's Marginal Way. Seeking to walk in the way of Jesus. We are an open and affirming church, faithfully using who we are and what we have to serve those on the margins of our community. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Jesus gave us one law, love God. And to love God requires loving our neighbor as ourselves. Well, it is impossible to obey the law of love if you don't love yourself. Self-love is celebration of God's work in creation. How can you see God in others without affirming that you also bear the image of God. Loving God necessarily involves loving not just the soul that God created in you, but your mind and your body as well. Loving God means trusting that you were given a mind for intellectual pursuit that doesn't hinder spirituality, that doubt is the companion, not the enemy of faith. That truth is found in different forms, in fact and in faith. Loving God means caring for your body in exercise and in rest, in work and in recreation. It means seeking the benefits of prayer reflection, and worship. Loving God is a journey, not so much to find meaning, for you are born with meaning and purpose, but to affirm your God-given worth in finding your particular calling. In this way, you find your role in serving and expanding God's realm of love. Self-love is not self-centeredness. Self-love is a celebration of your worth based on the astounding discovery that you are loved beyond your wildest imagination 
by the God who made you and loves you just the way you are, while also challenging you to become the person that God has made you to be. Holy light, shine on us as we gather to seek you. Reveal yourself in the colorful diversity of splinted light in the rainbow. Reveal yourself in the steadfast burning of stars flickering through millions of miles and years. Remind us that the gift of rainbow only comes because of storm and the gift of starry skies only through darkness. Help us to discover your many and varied gifts, even in unexpected and surprising times, including now, places, including here, and people, including us. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from Isaiah, the 43rd chapter, first through second verses, 18th through 21st verses. And this is from the Inclusive Bible. But now Leah and Rachel and Jacob hear the word of Yahweh, the one who created you, the one who fashioned you, Israel. Do not be afraid, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through, through the seas, I will be with you. When you pass over the rivers, you will not drown. Walk through fire, and you will not be singed. Walk through flames, and you will not be burned. Forget the events of the past. Ignore the things of long ago. Look, I am doing something new. Now it springs forth. Can't you see it? I'm making a road in the desert and setting rivers to flow in the wasteland. Wild beasts will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I will put water in the desert and rivers in the wasteland for my chosen people to drink. These people whom I form for myself, so that they might declare my praise.
In the second chapter of Genesis, there is a second creation story. And in this story, there are three rivers and a garden in the midst of them. And that's where humans are placed. And God brings all the animals before the humans to name. And then I hear an echo of that story here in the words of the prophet Isaiah. The people have left the garden. There's now a wilderness. And in this wilderness, those animals that have been named, the jackal and the ostrich, are going to honor God by their very living. And the people who are called by God's name, the ones whom God names as God's own, even though they have wandered into a wilderness, will, by claiming their name, give praise to God. I hear in this a call for all of us to behold this new thing that God is doing, that God is always doing, that there is always a new creation if we are seeking it out and if we know who we are and claim our name as God's very own. Did you ever attempt to give yourself a nickname? If you did, I'll bet it didn't go very well. My roommates in college and I tried to give ourselves nicknames for our softball team. We were Skip, Chip, and Kip because it sounded really good as a double play combination. But that was it. The names didn't stick because they weren't given to us. That's how a nickname works, right? People see something about you and because of that characteristic, they give you a nickname. If other people see it and repeat it, it takes and you keep it, right? Well, that's a kind of name changing that happens in scripture. We see it a number of times at always at key moments. Abraham was not always Abraham. Before he was called by God, before he had his mission, his purpose, he was Abram. It was his encounter with the holy that had the name change from Abram to Abraham. Jacob was Jacob until he was wrestling with the angel the night before he was to see his brother Esau, whom he had cheated. And it was the wrestling with the angel that resulted in the blessing of having his 
hip permanently disabled so he would have a limp and given a new name, Israel, which means contends with God. For the rest of his life, he'd have to introduce himself, not as Jacob, but as the God wrestler. And Peter wasn't always Peter. He was Simon when Jesus called him. And it was Jesus who gave him the nickname Peter, which means the rock. You can almost hear the other disciples snickering when they hear that because they would remember Peter attempting to walk on water with all of that alleged faith that he had and sinking like a rock. But Jesus says, because you have seen that I am the Messiah, you are the rock upon which I will build the church. <laughs> Remembering, of course, that even that rock ended up denying him three times. So sometimes the name is not exactly what we live up to. In this passage, we hear God speaking to God's people, saying that I have called you by name. Of course, in this case, it's a bit like a parent calling a child by their full name. You know, when you hear your middle name, you know you're in trouble. And in some ways, that's what's happening here. The translators of this passage that we read today, the inclusive Bible, include the women's names. They're not there in the original, but that's the idea. The name Jacob stands for all of Israel. And God is not saying, my people Israel. God is saying, my people Jacob. That before time, before the wrestling, before the knowing, before the calling. There is something about living up to your name that we see in this passage. The people are not living up to the name Israel. They're not contending with God. They are content to be the people that they were before the encounter. Perhaps you have an aspirational name. Perhaps you were named after someone as, as I was. My father's friend in the Navy was named Ian, so he named his first son that. So perhaps you bear a memory, a heritage, something to live on in the world, and that's part of your meaning in life. Or maybe you were given a name with a great meaning. Maybe a name like joy, or faith, or hope. Names that one can aspire to live up to. And that sort of living into your name, or claiming your true name, is what this Phoenix Affirmation is about. It says that you are born with all the purpose and meaning you will ever need, because you and I, every person ever born, or ever will be born, was born a child of God, bears the image of God, and therefore might claim the name of God, and be called by God's name. And as we discern who we are, we might discern that, like the people in this passage, that we're living a life prior to our encounter with the divine, that we're not living those holy lives, that we're not wrestling with God to make meaning here and now. And if that's the case, then we need to live into our names, aspire to be called by the name of God. The early church was known as followers of the way. They did not become Christians until by their actions, people saw that they were loving. They cared for people who were not even in their own family when the plague came through. They didn't draw in, they moved out and families were rejecting even their own family members when they had the plague, putting them literally out on the street. And it was the followers of the way, these ones who knew Jesus as Messiah, who would care for them and take them in. And people said about them, look at these Christians, see how they love. You see, that is 
what all of these affirmations have been about, about love. Because they are grouped into these three categories of the three great loves, love of God, love of neighbor, and love of self. And my friends, the truth is that these are all of one piece, that all of this discussion of love is a discussion of God because God is love. Therefore, love is God. So if we are to love God, we are to love love. And Jesus told us how to do that by loving our neighbor in the same way that we love ourselves. Each of us needs to affirm that we are children of God, worthy of all the love that we might offer to another, and that the other is just like we are, a child of God, worthy of love. It is that simple and that challenging. And in many ways, this final affirmation is a summation of all of them. It brings us to the culmination of vocation. Vocation, which means literally calling. We think of our life's work as our vocation, and it's somehow separated from our being. We don't make meaning with it. It's what we do to earn a living so that perhaps we can retire from it and then live or have some time off so we can enjoy. But what if, what if each of us found our true calling? What if each of us understood who we are in the eyes of God, who God has made us to be and loves us enough to keep pushing us toward that goal. What if? What if each of us knew that sweet spot where exerting energy is met with so little resistance that the energy passes on and like a tennis racket when you hit in that sweet spot gets the perfect shot every time. Have you known those moments? Have you had those moments in your life when the thing you were doing might seem hard to others, but easy to you because it is your thing to do? I don't know what that is for you. Sometimes I'm not sure what it is for me, but part of it is doing this, trying to spread the message of God's love. I know that at those times when I do something that I see the impact of how it influences and helps another, that I feel so fed by that, that I want to do it again and again. There are things that we've done in our lives, raising children that people think are just beyond incredible, so much hard work. But I can tell you in the moment, it just felt right. And it didn't feel hard because it was right. So search yourself, pray about it. Think about what it is that God calls you to do. And then do it. Just do it. Do your one thing. Because each of us needs to do the thing we are called to do. And trust God to put the tapestry together. For you see, a bunch of threads on a table do not make a tapestry. And if you're looking at a tapestry from the back, it looks like a tangled mess knots and different colors. But when you see it from the front, from the God's eye view, when you step back a bit, you see that all the pieces, individually not much of anything, together are beautiful. That's celebrating vocation. It's about diversity. Not all of us being the same, but all of us being uniquely the thing that God has created. That you become the creation that God wanted for you. And your meaning is fulfilled when you allow God to use the gifts that only you possess. Friends, if you want to save the world, you do it by being you. You find your meaning. You find your purpose. You follow your calling. And in that way, each of us contributes to the whole, to the work of our God, creating unity and blessing all of creation and bringing the realm of heaven, the realm of love, into existence here and now.
That is what we have been born to do. May it be so. Amen. If you are engaged with us, we would love for you to show your support. At minimum, by sharing this message. The video is a simple thing to share. And we would love for you to like our page. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Help us out that way to spread this word. And also help us out by financial giving. If you visit our webpage, you will find a spot on there where you can make a financial donation. Any and all gifts are most assuredly appreciated, and they help us to continue our ministry, not just in spreading the word, but walking the word, because we indeed are a people who choose to take who we are and what we have in order to serve those on the margins. Won't you help us do that? Thank you so much. Listen for the voice of your God telling you what it is that you need to hear. So don't be surprised at how that voice comes to you. Don't be surprised that God's voice speaks to you. Don't be surprised that God calls you by name. For God eagerly desires to do just that and to let you know that you are loved beyond your wildest imagination and that you have a specific purpose for this time and this place. So live that purpose. Go forth from this place, from this time, whatever this looks like for you, and give glory to the God of creation, the one who knows even the sparrow that falls. May this glorious God who knows you and names you lift you on gentle breezes that you might soar with eagles and bless you with the gift of vision and give glory to the Christ who comes to you and challenges you in the forms of the least, the last, and the lost, surprising you by their presence. May the Christ bless you with tears, tears that you shed with others, both in joy and in sorrow. And may God's wild, untamed Holy Spirit wild as any wild goose, bless you and lead you into places where you may not go on your own, blessing you with that touch of foolishness to believe that you are loved and you are named by your God. And may the love of God be with you all and all those whom you love and all those whom none but God loves now and until that day of God's judgment, when justice will roll down like waters and peace will blossom among all the peoples. Amen.